cloud. Okay, cool. And we're going. Um, so I guess I'll kind of do the intro. Um, hey, everybody. Um, another uh, Virginia Solidarity Economy uh, speaker series um, for us all. And tonight, um, we're going to talk a little bit about participatory budgeting. Um, and I don't know um, who has ever heard of this or knows about it. Or um, if you have, maybe you can just like, you know, just pop it in the chat and be like, yeah, I heard about it. Or, you know, I know I've never heard about it before. Um, but it's something that um, both Daniel and I have been con conspiring <laughs> on in our separate <laughs> worlds. Um, for a while. Um, so we wanted to take a, a moment um, just to talk to you all and share a little bit about what we've been doing um, both in Charlottesville and Richmond. Um, Daniel, do you wanna say anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's good. I think in this group, uh, probably a good portion of you have definitely heard of participatory budgeting before, but whether you or not, you've been able to experience it um, either in your city or in another, uh, my first introduction to PB was in New York City while I was working for a council member in the Bronx. Um, uh, council, former council member Richie Torres, now Congress member for the 15th district. Uh, and I helped do, I helped organize with our, um, you know, district director uh, around uh, rolling out our PB process for the year, collecting ideas, and then also getting out the word to uh, actually have everyone vote on the final projects that were selected. So uh, without getting into that detail, that was my first exposure to it. And that was, you know, not but three or four years ago. Um, but it's got a, a rich history across the world and now um, is gaining a lot more strength in the United States. So it's quite exciting. And Matthew has been a champion of it for a while. And I'm, I've newly taken on the call to action um, over the past couple of years. Yeah, I mean, in terms of my engagement with it, it um, I was doing kind of community-based development work kind of north of New York City, um, primarily like working with a bunch of pro uh, nonprofits working in like community, uh, like neighborhood revitalization work, like housing work, um, food access work, um, and some environmental sustainability work. We were all kind of working together. My my role was more on the arts side. I, I came in as a as a um, as an arts person um, and trying to think about how do we use creativity and people's imaginations to rethink cities. And then it just so happened that a friend of mine um, got a job working for what what was the participatory budgeting project, which is the national organization that has been really driving forward. Um, what everybody calls PB because it's so hard to say participatory budgeting. Um, um, so, so learned a lot about there, made some connections, read read some stuff, and then when I moved to Charlottesville, I started to get some stuff going, and we did a pilot process um, in 2016, 2017, which I'll show you some photos of. Um, but um, yeah, it's just it's a it's one way, like it's another little piece of the sol like the solidarity economy, right? It, it's like for me, it's really about trying to think about how, like we, we think so much about private capital, right? Private dollars and how those get spent or accessed or build wealth or well, this is like on the public side, like how do you use public dollars, which are which are all our tax dollars? Um, like how do we actually have a, a much bigger role in deciding what those are? Um, so um, should we show the video? Yeah, I think that's a great start. So instead of like hearing us blather on about what PB is, we're going to show a quick video um, about um, that the participatory budgeting project produced. And hopefully I can do this without screwing it up. Um, and then we'll show some photos of a few different things. I think it's this one. And sure. Can everybody see, see that? Or, see the, the street i think i can push i can go into full screen mode and then it will pop up um my computers whoa okay i'm just gonna play this right if you live in this community 
and you pay taxes, come out and vote, decide how your tax dollars get spent. Participatory budgeting gives people real power over real money to make the decisions that affect their lives. It's a democratic process in which ordinary community members directly decide how to spend part of the public budget. Oh, this is different because you're actually voting for where the money is going to be spent instead of allowing them to decide where to spend the money. Who knows better about their community than the people that live in their community? not be afraid of the big words, participatory budgeting. It sounds boring, but it's the opposite of that. So how does it work? First, people brainstorm ideas. They come together in meetings and assemblies and start to think of what kinds of projects they would like to see in their neighborhood. We had to think big. We have a million dollars that we could use so we can fund parks, health issues, streets. Volunteers work with experts to turn people's initial ideas into full project proposals. We started with maybe about 40 projects, and so we had a series of budget delegate meetings, and we narrowed down the list into about four or five projects. We met with the Parks Department, and we talked about what we wanted to see change in some of the parks and how we were going to work with them. What are the real needs of the community? If you only have a certain amount of money, what is it that you can do that's going to benefit as many people as possible? I'm dreaming of new benches, modern benches. Seniors have no way to go. Displays at bus shelters throughout the district, and it will tell people when their next bus is due to arrive. We're asking for a projector and 30 Mac laptops. State of the art to fitness center. To put solar panels on a firehouse. After volunteers share the top projects, the community gets ready to vote. It's a way of validating every voice in our community and saying, you know what, whatever your position is, you live in our community, you have a right to decide. And that me as a representative and government should respond and should listen to that voice. Anybody could vote in this process. Immigrants, whether you're documented or not, and people that normally don't get to vote. Most people, they don't even know that six CEOs can come out here and vote today. Some of them are really surprised. They said, really? I said, yes. They have a voice. projects with the most votes get funded. The Red Hook Library Community Garden, yeah! right here. Yeah! The projects are then implemented over the next few years. And the following year, the process starts again. People brainstorm new ideas, turn them into new projects, vote on them, and fund more improvements for their community. PB becomes part of the budget process. It becomes a new way of governing. I think this is like the greatest wave of democracy coming into the United States. It started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 1989. From there, it spread all over Latin America to over 1,500 cities around the world. In Toronto, public housing tenants have decided how to spend millions of dollars on improvements to their buildings. City council members in Chicago, New York, and other cities have engaged thousands of residents in allocating discretionary funds. Entire cities have launched PV, such as in Vallejo, California, for funds from a sales tax, and in Boston for youth funds. Even schools and universities have used PV. This was a great opportunity for you to be a part of government and better the city you live in. Who wouldn't want to take advantage of that? You're creating a more educated platform of voters overall. So I think this can only be good for the big project of democracy. Okay, and we're back. So um, we wanted to ask those, you can come on screen or type it in the chat. Um, just curious about what resonated in that video. I always love, I love to hear people's thoughts after seeing, seeing that video, which I've shown so many times. <laughs> Um, hi. Hey. <laughs> hey. Um, well, I'm curious about like, is it still going on in New York? Do they allocate a lot of their money than the city of New York? Yeah. So um, when it first started, it was very much a voluntary program. Um, and while I was there, it was still voluntary. Council members would decide 
whether or not they wanted to implement a PV process in their district. So it started out with just discretionary dollars and um, the first sort of big investment was about a million dollars per district, uh, which for scale, uh, each district was about 200,000 residents. So uh, for comparatively, that's about the size of, uh, you know, a little bit smaller than the city of Richmond. Um, so pretty sizable population getting to uh, participate in allocating that $1 million. Um, and now they've actually increased, they, they've made it so it's citywide, every district has access to this. It's not just up to the council member and they've invested instead of just a potential total of around 50 million, but actually um, 250 million. So a huge um, investment in their budget. Now, obviously the, the city of New York's budget is massive. So it's still a pretty small percentage, but it's a really huge investment comparatively um, to what they were working with before. So it strikes me that the magnitude is on the order of Harrisonburg's community development block grant mm -hmm. uh, on a per capita basis. We get about half a million dollars to, to allocate for about 60,000 people. Uh, now it's grown to an order of magnitude bigger than that. So that's um, for scale. It's still a tiny part of the budget, as you're saying, but in terms of kinds of projects that could come into being. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the biggest the biggest city that or the biggest allocation around the globe is actually in Paris. Paris, I think, has like it's between six and ten percent of its overall budget. Um, which again, like is you know, hundred and several hundred million dollars. Um, you know, like to get to put a little a little scale on like Porto Alegre, it's been around like seventy six million a year. Um, um, but then, and then you've like cities like Boston, Boston's doing like a youth-based program. They've been doing this program called Youth Lead the Change for about, you know, eight or nine years. And that's like a million dollars that, that, that youth decide on, on, um, so and Seattle has a program. They mentioned Toronto, like every city is totally different from like why or how they go about doing this. Um, there's no like one way. Uh, like in Phoenix, like the school districts are doing it actually, like the school district dollars. Um, and youth are kind of like playing a bigger role in it. So, um, and then there's like, you know, cities and nonprofits and all different kinds of like, you know, organizations that are starting to do it a little by little. Anybody else have a, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the voting process on this seemed pretty interesting. Um, it almost seemed just like a, almost like a, a caucus style uh, a voting process. Uh, I guess the, the one thing that came to mind for me was just um, uh, how exactly are, are the public after they made these votes uh, holding the city officials accountable to make sure that they actually spend the money where the the people that voted want want them to spend it. Daniel, yeah, do you want to take that one? You you have actually more direct experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's a it's a great question. I think it will probably vary from city to city, but in New York, they were lucky enough for it to be such a just a standard operating procedure at this point in how the city functions that it's built directly into the capital uh, budget. So every year they're, you know, putting shovels in the ground. Um, in our experience, we would see completion within one to two years for each project that was voted on um, and successfully, you know, uh, accepted within the million dollar allocation. So I do think that you have to kind of build that culture where the budget office is deciding like, yep, this is going to be in our formula and it's going to, always be something that we're ready to you know structure such that there's no question about well we'll we'll put it in maybe the five-year plan um instead it's no we're this is going to be at top of our list each fiscal year um and that's something that 
as we've started to broach the conversation more seriously in Richmond, we're uh, trying to really build that expectation from the outset because you're right, it could you know be easy for a local government to sort of pass it off um, and say that it's in the plan to be implemented at some point, but you know when we actually find it to be convenient. Um, so the the levers for accountability uh, on the resident side is it's a little bit more difficult. Um, typically, it falls on the elected officials um, on the legislative side who are fronting a lot of that engagement process. Um, at least in my experience, to to really hold the administration accountable um, to ensure that that happens. Yeah, it, bring, it brings up a lot of questions about transparency and accountability. I mean, there like there's so much of what you hear people talk about participatory budgeting, and it's they talk a lot about those two things, like transparency. And the issue, one of the issues with this that can pop up is that. Um, is that if you get to this point and you've gone through this process and all, all of a sudden council pops in and says, oh, we don't necessarily agree with the decisions that are made, then you like, you lose all like trust and relationships and transparency of a process. So the processes tend to be super transparent from, from, from the get go. Um, um, and I mean, even to the point, like they didn't, in, the video is a little bit old. So like that, that number of like, of, of, uh, examples of participatory budgeting is way bigger. It's, it's probably in the more of the three to 5,000 range now around the world. Um, and um, um, and yeah, you just see things kind of evolving and growing based on on what people want to make happen. Um, like, um, I, like, like, Port like the, the country of Portugal has implemented its countrywide. I mean, it's not a huge country, but for it to do that is a pretty important thing. Um, so any other thoughts or questions, ideas, responses? Have you seen this paying for salaries, paying for labor? Usually like with the community development block grant, it's the usual nonprofit sort of thing. You can, you can fund all kinds of things, but you can't fund, uh, staff. So, are there any, any places that are funding people? Yeah. I think so, right, Daniel? I mean, I think there are examples of it. Um, I have not seen that in my experience. In New York, it's all capital projects. Um, our proposal for Richmond is starting with capital, but hoping to move towards um, being able to use it for program funding as well. Um, but it is. Obviously, it's a more difficult prospect, uh, as you can imagine, because that funding needs to be then matched year after year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I can't think of any examples off the top of my head where we've actually funded people by a PB, but it may be the case that it exists. Um, Matthew, you might know better. But. I mean, I don't, it depends on what you mean by people, right? Like if you're installing a bus stop, right, someone has to build that bus stop and you know and then the city installs it um uh, i know in in greensboro and other places like in murals tend to be a, a a thing that people do a lot of i mean they're they have to pay the artists to make those murals so i mean i think on uh, and sometimes and then in, like in chicago i know that early on in chicago there was a, there was instead of it just being a re citizen dread led thing so if a citizen said oh i want to create a garden they then had to go out as a part of that a proposal development process to probably find a partner with a nonprofit to help work on that. Um, so, and I think that some of that budget can be worked into supporting, you know, if you're going to put a garden, you've got, you've got to pay someone to plant the plants. You can't just buy the plants. <laughs> so um, I think those are, there, there are pieces of it, um, but then there's like kind of steps built into that to, to make sure that that goes towards what it goes towards. So Yeah, you can definitely expand upon those externalities 100% um, because they, they definitely spur a lot more involvement, collaboration. Um, and typically, it will also activate the nonprofit and the philanthropic community to give to other projects or to expand upon existing projects because we can see already that the neighborhood is behind it. 
Cool. Jennifer, were you going to ask something? <laughs> yeah, like um, I have a couple questions. One question is, what kind of technology is used in the voting? Mm -hmm. Great and the question. deliberation. Yeah, great question. So it's, it's, it's different. Every, you know, like I said, every different series is different. Um, I think a lot of people recognize since there's so, so much of this is about equity and access, right? And getting people who haven't had access to, to participate in voting because, um, and even thinking about people who, who, you know, maybe they have a, a criminal record and in their state they can't vote. So, but they can in this, they can participate in this. So it's like, a, it's a, it's a process for getting people engaged. So, um, I've seen everything from like, you know, again, door to door paper, um, you know, sitting out a corner of a street, uh, sitting at a gas stop, talking to people, like really kind of grassrootsy efforts, but they're always paired with some kind of like technology. So there's a ton of different um, uh, technologies that, that people have created to do that. And um, I, I think Stan like Stanford has a has like a mapping project where you can actually, when you submit your idea, you actually put it on a map and then you say, okay, well, this is a parks and rec project because it has to do with the park or a, a transportation project. Um, and so they, they can track a little bit. Um, um, I mean, we even designed, we, I worked with some students at UVA to design like a, um, a, like a, just a website for that. We ne actually never used it because Charles will never move forward with stuff. But, um, um, and you've, I mean, you've seen, Desidim or Desidim or whatever that they use in Barcelona. Um, so there's a bunch of different different technologies out there. So yeah, and um, yeah, the other question I had is like, I don't know. It seems like it fits into like a movement of del deliberative democracy. And um, are there any examples of where it fits into that bigger picture of deliberative democracy? And my, and my other question is about whether anybody's using it to make like one of the biggest problems uh, that cause that is related to inequity in education is how we fund our schools. So is are there any places where they're using deliberative democracy so that schools aren't just funded based on the wealth of the community. Yeah, those are my two questions. Those are just what come to me like about, about this movement. If you, if you like, tell me what you mean by deliberative, deliberative democracy. Like what, like what, how do you define that? Where people actually just ordinary citizens are involved in creating policies that the government then has to follow. Mm -hmm. I would say there's like there's there's the great thing about PB is that there's like engagement throughout every step of the process right like you get you typically need they, there's a new uh diagram that they use I don't know I can show it to you all but they typically what happens is residents design the process like you get a commission together and that's what they're like what Daniel's working on right now in Richmond. And they, they like, they sit down and create a rule book for how the process is going to go. So like, that's like community control from the get go. And then, and then you go into this process of like proposals and idea collection. So you go out and you do this broad engagement. And they, like when we were in Charlottesville, we did a, I, we committed to doing a door to door. Like we were working in a very specific neighborhood where like we were going to knock on every door multiple times, like talk to people, really do it grassroots. Um, in New York City, I, I mean, I don't think they do that. I think they do like meetings and events at schools. Um, you saw some, there's some photos in the video of people sitting at like tables at schools and, you know, throwing ideas up on, on a piece of paper. And then like they do the thing called dot democracy where people kind of vote by dot, putting dots on things. Um, um, and then, and then even like, even when the proposals, like those ideas come forward and you go into a proposal stage, um, like ideas get vetted again and they get talked about. And so like, it's like throughout the whole process, there's kind of like, like engagement built into it. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I wonder about the, the policy change. I mean, Daniel, you might be able to talk about that a bit more. I mean. Right. 
Because that's a big, yeah. I mean, to go from collecting ideas and investing in projects in a community to like actual physical policy change is, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger conversation. Yeah, it's, and it's a really good question. I think, mm. so depending on how you set up your process, it can engender some deliberative de democratic um, practices, I think. But at the end of the day, you know, the, I think Matthew and I have said this a hundred million times. It's, it's a PPP is not the solution to our democracy, but, um, and in many ways, I, I think of it as like, it's our, our first step into really changing the culture around how we make decisions because it gives got local government specific, I mean, typically local governments, but also can be state and national governments as we've seen now, it gives them a little bit of a taste of what it's like to just seed control um, and really actually step back and give up space to their residents to decide where money is gonna go, which is oftentimes our most sacred role as governments is like, well, we get to dictate where we invest. And it's like, well, imagine a world in which actually we shared that power. Uh, and that is where I think PB is that starting point where now we see in places where we have had some robust processes for a while, you start to lead to a different kind of culture around it. Um, so in New York, I, I have to admit, it's not my favorite process. It is, it's, it's developing and they're definitely improving upon it, but it's very much a great way for council members to remain popular in their districts. Uh, by running a good process and getting community projects that make people happy. Um, and so to move away from that model and to really get to a place where we're expanding and deepening that engagement so that we are collabor collaborating on policy, unfortunately right now that is very much dependent on leaders. And it's not the most sustainable model, but I've seen you know, folks who have been involved in participatory budgeting, they then become the folks who run for office and try to change the model. Um, so actually a good friend of mine is now running for city council in the Bronx um, in the neighboring district to where we were, we both uh, worked for council member Torres and um, his name is Adolfo Abreu and his campaign, they have, um, they've been, sort of championing this notion of collaborative policy making with residents uh, where they built their campaign platform by talking to residents, by um, having listening sessions, by actually, you know, almost doing like a participatory budgeting level of engagement where they put their team out in neighborhoods every single day to really do some of that dot democracy, to do some of that community planning, to work with our the organizers in the community to identify the, the, the critical needs. And then they developed and adapted their platform as they move forward. Um, so unfortunately that model is again, dependent on leaders to kind of take up the charge to, uh, to begin to operate like that. And that's why I think we kind of need to find ways to, um, I mean, as Matthew said, some of the, most critical pieces are the community designing the process so that it can become a sustainable model because it's not legislators or the administration who's deciding how it's gonna work, but rather the community deciding how that is gonna be designed. Um, and from there, hopefully it can, it can spread to more areas. Um, so we do get into, as you, you're suggesting, some uh, a lot more uh, longstanding impactful policy decision-making being shared. Um, but at the moment, that just is at least in at least in examples in the United States that I've seen, it's it's harder for that to take place with the models that are being developed. Yeah, a very long winded answer. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. That's yeah. kind of what I thought, but I wanted to yeah. see from you. Yeah, I just I just add quick to that. Um, you're starting to see it with the the defund and like reinvest kind of things. Like PB has been put up as a as an as a as the, on the reinvest side of it. Like, like let's defund police, but then let's use it in a way that kind of skin scaffold. So like you can see it that kind of getting built into that kind of policy. Um, 
I think like Ash or uh, Austin's doing it with some of its reparations or its defund stuff. Um, again, but like Barcelona, like I'm thinking a lot about Barcelona and Como, like they were actually doing community assemblies and PB style like things that then when they got into office, they then kind of like turned into policy that they, they were trying to translate that. But I don't think there's, again, I think Daniel's right. Like their early research on P, like why city council members do PB is like top number one thing was to get reelected. Um, and, it, and it plays both sides of the, of, this, of, this, of the parties too. Like you've got Republicans and Democrats doing this around the country. So um, I think our two party system has kind of limits what, what's sometimes what's possible um, in terms of that. Um, On the other side of that, you mentioned the, or I think it was in the film, the community members deciding and then working with experts. So this is something that I've seen a little bit close up. Uh, when you have a department in a, in a city manager, uh, in a council manager form, uh, those department heads can, can have a lot of territorial sort of feeling over their projects and they can be glad to have their good idea bought into by the public, but that bridge is kind of difficult. So there are a couple of ways. So one path is um, consultants who sap the expertise that's in house. Mm -hmm. um, another path might be taking expertise that's in house and making it truly at the service of the community. And then another I could think of would be maybe some sort of way that actually grows the public, sort of the opposite of the consultant model, so that when the public comes to the city, there's a deeper, richer resource so that they get a lot more, um, a lot more mileage for their, for their invest, for their, what they put into it. Um, how have you seen that bridge work between professional city staff and this process? I'll say, I'll say it's, it's, it's probably the reason why so that exact reason is why it hasn't moved forward in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, it's a, it's a power issue, right? Like you've got mm -hmm. city councilors think they hold power then you get staff that think they hold power and everybody's trying to hold on to their power. Um, I mean, we see a ton of, moment where residents are like traffic is horrible on my street we need we need a speed bump and then the traffic engineer shows up and says like does a traffic study and says no you don't need a speed bump because uh, my my data tells me you don't need that um but the people are like no we need a speed bump traffic is bad like so it's like how do you overcome that discrepancy in knowledge um so i talk a lot about this is like how do you i don't think it's totally always works but like how do you bring those knowledge that bring that knowledge together right and and have it be in conversation with each other to inform a, a decision and for for a traffic engineer not just to be an, a traffic engineer but to be like a person and for a community member to be a real person um and kind of humanizing people so that's a that's a big piece of this for me is think, thinking about how do you build those relationships yeah and i mean i'll i'll add to that right this expands just beyond participatory budgeting matthew your example hits right at home for me because obviously i work in local government and i can't tell you how many times i have people calling me and telling me that the speeding is so bad they don't feel safe letting their kids play out even on the sidewalk let alone in this you know on their block in the street and <clears throat> to hear back from a traffic engineer that, well, the data doesn't support that um, is a really difficult tension to, to then have to mediate because, you know, while I, you know, we want to make the best informed decisions, the, the data that we collect is not typically based in human experience. Um, and we can see from standards set by the manual on uniform traffic control devices that um, the emphasis is not on human experience, not on human scale infrastructure, but rather on the smooth movement of personal vehicles. Uh, and when we anchor ourselves in that decision-making, as far as I'm concerned, the data is no good. 
um, because if we're just looking at crashes, fatalities, and injuries, uh, has no actual reading on what does a mother feel comfortable with um, in terms of letting their children just ex you know actually live and exist outside of their home, uh, and that hopefully. You know, PB again doesn't solve everything, but that's one of those touch points where hopefully you can elevate that human experience for the you know the city staffer uh, and really bring it past just you know me trying to convince them by email that we need to take their concern seriously, um, but actually getting out and being on site with people um, can be typically way more impactful to really build on the context of that built environment and what that means for, uh, for a family. So we've got like 15 minutes left. Um, what do we want to do? Like I can show some photos of what we went through in Charlottesville. Uh, Daniel, or do you want to show something? Uh, I'd say definitely do that. I don't, my photo, I don't have, I, for whatever reason, I can't find photos from our PB processes in New York, unfortunately. Um, so that may have been just in my work computer up there. But, so I say definitely dive into the Charlottesville stuff. I know, Matthew, you also wanted to um, save a little bit of time to talk about some more general, um, you know, Vasa and stuff if you wanted, but either way. Let's just like, let's just keep going as long as people are interested in it. So let me, I'm just gonna show you, so you can see this slide, um, yeah. which is on a different screen for me. Let me, let me, maybe I won't move it. Is it still there? You guys all see it? Um, so just let me just give you a sense, because I think this might, the work that Daniel is doing to implement this through, this, through Richmond is like a totally different level of what is actually probably really feasible sometimes. Like you've got to start small and kind of build towards this. Um, unless you're like a person that wants to run for office and then just make it happen. Um, but you still have a lot of work to do. Um, but in Charlottesville, like I was trying to kind of just bring this into the community um, and think about it as a, as a way of doing things in a different way. And one of the issues was that the city just had just done this, this little planning process in a neighborhood that was historically black and like the whole process was really looked like not to like erase erase that community um it really wasn't thinking about who is there it was like more thinking about who will be there in the future um and so we did this process that we called be seville it was about being a different seville um, um and trying to really recognize the work that uh, knowledge that we're in that was in the neighborhood. So it was in a neighborhood on the south side of town. Um, and so, uh, and we also, the funding we got for this was a grant that we got from the National Endowment for the Arts. So it had an arts and creativity focus. Um, so we did things like, um, let me see if this works, like this. So we worked with some students over the summer, some high school students. Um, they designed a cardboard, a 30 foot cardboard rocket. Um, and their whole idea was like to blast off into the future um, with this rocket. Um, and so inside the rocket, people could come in and like, write their ideas. So it was like an idea collection process. So instead of like handing out cards or like we just, we did an event, it was up for like two weeks and people just wrote ideas down um, and then we collected them all and we added them to the list of, of ideas during the idea collection. So, um, so that was a big piece of this. But then we just did like the, what was the kind of a typical um, um, kind of engagement strategy where we like we we created these like little postcards and we took them around the community, but we targeted specific people because we really wanted to make sure that the public housing residents, low income housing residents, um, could have had had actually had had the, the the resources were put into them so that they could have a strong voice, and we actually went into schools too. Um, like we worked with some uh, middle school students, some some fifth and sixth graders, um, and seventh graders at some local schools um, to collect their ideas. So like they they did things like like this, they put these little cards out. Um, so we collected the ideas, um, and then the other thing we did is because we really didn't believe 
that the data that we, the knowledge that we collect was ours. Like it wasn't VC bills, it was the communities. We felt we needed to go back to them. Um, we heard a lot of this, like, you know, you're not listening to us, city, like residents. So we were like, you know, well, you spoke community and we're, we're listening. Um, and so we kind of add, did this, what was a, um, a newspaper um, that we, again, we went to every house, we went to, uh, three, 3,000, a little, little over 3,000 houses and drop these off at every house, just read them out through schools and whatever possible way we get them into the neighborhood. But if you open this up, we had taken all the information there. We had kind of organized it, ranked it based by what, what people saw, um, um, you know, kind of fed it back to them. And then they could go online with a website too that they could look at and look at, just look at the information and co comment on it. Um, so this was just a way for them to kind of see this information and it was for them. Um, um, yeah. And then from that, um, uh, some specific proposals, because so usually you do this delegate process where people kind of like take the ideas, organize them, assess them, rank them. And then from that, like projects kind of come out of that. Um, and what we did instead was, um, we had residents do that little bit of that ranking and then artists came in and proposed projects in relationship to those um, efforts. So in the end, we had like 25 different proposals that people could vote on. Um, we took right. the votes out, sorry. Um, took the votes out, did the ballots out to everybody in the community, distributed them, engaged them, did an online version of that using Google Forms. Um, and they voted and they ended up choosing this. So there's a, there was a, um, an African-American graveyard that had been totally did, like, left to, to kind of do whatever it wants to do. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on to, to re bring people's vision to that. And so they, the people that were organizing that wanted to do a, a memorial because they knew there were a lot of graves that were not seen or not re remembered um, there. So they, they got top vote. And then like one of the other projects was a, a garden project at um, a public housing site that a public housing resident actually, she drove this whole thing. Um, she, you know, she got out, got people voting, got people engaged. Um, and so um, they, they, they got this garden going. Um, and it's, it was around for a lot. And now they're doing, actually we're doing a redevelopment here. So um, we only had $15,000. So we, um, Funded, we just funded like uh, three projects at $5,000. Um, um, and that was a pilot. And then that this happened also right before um, 2017 in Charlottesville. And so when everything, all the trauma happened, city council was looking for something to do as a response and to build trust. And they decided to do something, but it was pretty meager. They, were, they allocated $100,000 and then over a year and a half, we did a design process and then you had a city council, city council, city manager change. You had the budgeting person leave. You had the council engagement person leave. You had all this change happen and they put it on hold. So um, it's been on hold ever since. So I might need to go out and start building some desire to bring it back. Um, so that's, that's the next step. But that's, I mean, that's the small like version. Lots of volunteers you know, lots of like door-to-door -door engagement. Um, you know, we had a moment, I remember where we were in one of the low-income housing sites and I, I came around a corner and I was hanging up door hangers and people were like, yeah, we got enough of those. Like we, they've seen it enough. Um, they knew about it though. Um, so that's, I thought that was a, an important thing. Um, um, but I think like, like they said in the video, the biggest problem is that if you're going to do it once and you, you need to continue to do it. Um, and so we just haven't had the buy-in from city council to do that. So, um, so maybe, maybe there's a future where that is, might be possible. So, but in Richmond, Danny, you're going to do something totally different. Like you're, like you're using capital dollars and to this magnitude of scale. Yeah, our, I mean, our goal for the first year, uh, hopefully, is, you know, 3 million might 
dream would be to start at 5 million, but might have to do a little bit smaller of an initial allocation to make folks comfortable in the city side. But um, we, you know, just passed the budget on Monday for this whole city of Richmond, um, which will include a hundred thousand dollar grant to storefront for community design, who's our dedicated project manager for this, at least the first couple of years. Um, eventually we want the process to be taken on and, and um, <clears throat> adopted fully by the city, but at least in the outset, it's um, actually kind of nice to have a local organization that has really deep ties in organizing within the community to lead the engagement in the planning. So um, they are our primary point of contact for this and they'll be helping us do um, the first full year of planning and then uh, at least the first full year of implementation, uh, actually doing the idea collection um, and then helping us get out the word to to eventually um, help folks vote on projects. But for now, it's uh, about probably $3 million in next year's budget, depending uh, on how this first year of planning goes. But we're currently in the process of recruiting for a steering commission. So if you have folks in Richmond who you know would kind of be into this, um, let me know, because I would love to connect them to how to get involved so that they can help us really um, write that rule book over the summer. Uh, our deadline is July 1st for um, steering commission applications, but we've got a handful already, but uh, we're really hoping to get some more involvement from the South side. Um, that's one of our, our really critical goals is, um, and from the outset, it's been, how do we expand this beyond typical engagement processes undertaken by the city? Uh, we just actually wrapped up our Richmond 300 comprehensive plan. So um, that was probably the most robust engagement process we've had uh, so far as a city, at least in, in my lifetime. And we want to take that and build upon it so that we can re-engage and reinvigorate some of that, um, that excitement in the South side so that they have a larger voice at the table. Um, if you're familiar with the history of Richmond, then you know that the majority of the South side has uh, Chesterfield County levels of in infrastructure because it used to belong to Chesterfield County and we annexed uh, part of the county in the, in the 70s or prior to the 70s, I should say, before our ability to annex was cut off. Um, and, uh, you know, um, we're still to this day unable to, uh, or not unable to, we haven't actually invested in infrastructure in the south side to match that of the north side. So we've got uh, many communities where you can't um, walk from your house to your local elementary school, whereas that is uh, very much just the expectation in many other parts of the city. Um, but it's simply because there's no sidewalk infrastructure. So that alone is a, is a lift in and of itself. Um, and so we want to use this initial design and engagement process to elevate that disparity um, even further than it already has been so that we can uh, center a lot of that uh, allocation in the south side. Cool. And Daniel, can you talk about equity issues? Like how, you, I mean, what's the equity conversation? Because I think that's something that yeah. is like it's it's talked about like I think if you if you all start to like look at PB processes around the country like equity is everywhere, but I think there's like the reality of what, the reality of, of it of trying to make it happen. So, yeah, it it's definitely something that we wrestled with um, when we were designing or writing rather the ordinance to create the steering commission and really kick off the process this year. Um, there were some council members that were interested in. Uh, you know, trying to figure out, I think before the process was even designed, how much would be allocated to each district. Um, and a lot of, a lot of folks just assumed it would be, we were going to be taking an egalitarian approach um, where everyone would just split it equally. But it is, I think the, it, what we ended up doing is leaving that decision up to the steering commission. Um, and we're hoping, and we're gonna be doing some, 
some guiding around this as well, guided conversations around the disparities between different districts um, so that they will hopefully come to that conclusion that in fact, the first district, which is by far the uh, wealthiest and whitest district in the city should not receive the same number of dollars as the eighth and the ninth district where we see our highest con concentrations of black and, um, and Latino communities. Uh, so, and not to mention decades of underinvestment, especially in infrastructure um, for obvious, uh, you know, racist historical reasons. Um, and so our goal is to have that conversation happen within the steering commission happen in public uh, and be elevated so that it's baked into our rule book. Um, and that, that was, it's been a sort of a difficult process to, to get there, but we really think that this is something that's very possible uh, over the next few months to, um, to ensure that that's baked into how the process uh, is designed. Yeah, and I'll just add quickly, like, like data around, and then, and I'll say like the study of participatory money in the United States is really new. Like there's not a lot of, of like really good um, research done on, on the stuff yet. So it's, it's still hard to quantify like it's true outcomes, but the, some of the early data shows that like actually women are, are more involved in participatory budgeting. Um, there's a higher low level of like immigrant black, uh, black and brown bodies that, that play a role, that play a role and, and vote in it. Um, there's early data that show that it actually doesn't prove voting turnout, like it, it, like by small percentages, but small percentages in the world we live in are, are can be huge. Um, um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there that is taking place and there needs to be more work on that, um, um, over time. So, and I know there's like a new global group called the people's people's hub or people's power. What is it called? Daniel? <laughs> I think it's people's hub people's, or there's no, yeah, something like that. Where is it? So. Yeah. Um, but it, it is kind of looking globally at, at research uh, uh, and, and documenting what's going on um, all over the world. So, um, yeah. So should we leave it to questions or any thoughts? Like any last, like, anybody ready to go and start this in their towns, like immediately? <laughs> Like what? Here's a question. Like what would what would like what do you see the opportunities or the limits? Like what what would you have to come up against or um, to make something like this happen? We had something like this in Harrisonburg. Uh, that that was a pivotal moment in the city. It, it was done without a lot of support. We didn't have the artists. We didn't have a photocopy budget. Uh, we didn't have a budget, uh, but. But as I as I listen to you describe your processes, it's uh, it's very much like our uh, our 7-Eleven project, which was that a corner store let the community use some land, and then we engaged a process very much like what you described to come up with what to do with the with the land, and so the things that. It, it, the, the level of agency that was increasing around the city at that time, I think, really had an impact. There were impacts, electoral impacts, so that corroborates what you're saying about the, the voting. Uh, I'm also pretty sure for a number of years I've been tracking incarceration rates, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I'm making the argument that it impacted our incarceration rates, decreased our incarceration rates. So kind of generally improve the health metrics of the city. But the problem, the problems we face, uh, one, this problem with staff that we described, getting staff buy-in. Um, another is, and I was gonna ask this and we can throw it out as a question, is while we have these innovative projects going on with one hand, we have with another hand, processes in the city that are chilling to participation. Now, police is, of course, the really the elephant in the room, but there are more subtle aspects of that, which I think you've heard me talk about 
more than once. Um, and I would put to you in Charlottesville and Richmond, what's the status of your nuisance ordinances? Do you have uh, inoperable vehicles? Do you have tall grass and weeds? Do you have trash in yards? And what is the philosophy of enforcement around that? And what's the impact? What's the interface between the city and the community coming from that department if you, if you have those? Because for us, that was like, and when the police department tried to do things, they find you know that they were working at odds. And what's what's the state of that in each of your cities? Yeah, I mean in Richmond, it's it's pretty typical. Um, <clears throat> we've got our tall grass and weeds ordinances. We've got uh, noise ordinances, which um, I think, in light of you know, the events of the past year or so, uh, the city and the mayor's team has encouraged the police department to uh, discontinue enforcement around, uh, but they're still on the books. Um, and obviously our code enforcement, uh, you know, division within the planning department is still alive and well, uh, so to speak, uh, for better or for worse, mostly for worse, I would say. Um, so we're still actively enforcing a lot of those uh, code enforcement, community development kind of um, ordinances that are baked into our zoning code. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add to that, like in Charlottesville, like just massive amounts of distrust, like between the city and and the city <clears throat> government and local residents, especially black residents. Um, and it's not something that this is going to overcome. And, and the oppositionality, the contention that's been so trained in people's minds for so long, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, so I think um, that's why I think the, the, the you know, making sure this is as community led as possible. So people like when we used to look at our steering committee for BCville, like I had a former city council member on that who was someone I knew who lived in the neighborhood. It was all people that actually lived in that neighborhood. Um, there was a mix of like public housing residents. So like when people could see the process and who was involved in the process, they could like recognize their themselves in, in that in that effort. And that was really important. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and I knew we were, I mean, the contentious nature of like of that small area plan that that city had done was was a big problem too. So, um, um, and we weren't gonna overcome that. Um, so I mean, my, my big issue actually has been, and Dan, I know you're doing this, the same, doing the same issue in, in Richmond is like, <laughs> you get city council members, you've got mayors who come in and be like, we need to change community engagement like we need to have a new relationship but you don't ever see them actually do anything mm -hmm. they talk a lot about it they say yeah i'm working towards it but like this is the one thing i value about participatory budgeting it's a pretty like it's got 30 years of history it works like it's not always perfect but like it's got like tangible steps that move towards um engaging the community in a totally different way um but i i, I don't think that city city staff city council really want to have that relationship they just it's it's like you know like if you're a, a overworked planner for the city uh who gets yelled at every meeting like they are like they want to leave and get home and have dinner with their family as soon as possible um um so it's a, it takes a different level it takes a desire um that's what's been great about like working with daniel and Andreas um, is that like Andreas has kind of had that desire from the get-go. Um, we've had to push him a little bit over time and you've had to push him mostly Daniel, but um, yeah, cause it, it is a, and people like people who are working on the defund side of policing and seeing PB as an answer. Like when I tell them that like, this is about a relationship. Um, they don't like that. They, 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 they want control of their of public dollars. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to find ways of making it tangible for people. And early on, I'll say like you had Republicans saying, you know, this is like, this is the tried and true, like you got control of your tax dollars. And that's, that's, that's partially true. And like the, the left wants to be like, oh, you have like, like, you know, this is about democracy and whatnot. And I, it's, it's about both um, in a lot of ways. Um, 
so that's a, that's a, those are big conversations and ongoing efforts. So, um, but I mean, if, if you really want to look at a really good process, that's amazing. That's been really working well, like go look at what Durham has been doing for the last few years. Um, it used to be that Greensboro was, a, was the closest space and the biggest Southern project in the US and Greensboro or Durham's just, they're doing 3 million a year or every other year. And it's just, an, it's been a really celebratory effort from a positive effort from the from the city to like engage community at a different level. Um, and I think they all walk, everybody walked away from that process being like, that was a success. So, um, but that means commitment. So if you don't have that commitment, um, you come up against hurdles all the time. So anyway, um, yeah. Eric or Jennifer, I don't know if you're still here. Like, do you have any last questions or thoughts? I'm still or... here. No, I've been listening and learning, and I'm really glad to learn about Durham. I just opened up their website. I'm going to look at that. So, no, I don't have any more questions. Thanks. Yeah, same here. No questions. Great. Well, you know, Daniel, do we have any like last little like brilliant tidbits <laughs> to tell everybody? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's, it, yeah, the biggest thing is, uh, finding ways to demand more of your, uh, of your local government. That's something that I've been kind of striving towards. I think Matthew, you hit the nail on the head talking about how there is sort of an unwillingness to go deeper than the typical levels of engagement that we do see. PB is a, a really great way to force that on a government. <clears throat> if you get them to agree to do PB, then suddenly they have to do more robust engagement that they're not typically used to. And again, it, that's the piece where I think it, it gives them a taste and it gets them a little bit more comfortable with seating control. Um, and it's not perfect, but it can be done really well. And it can, I think, lead to increased and improved trust. But I mean, I always, I. I know this is like in uh, you know, organizing 101, uh, but like I, I always kind of think back and I reflect on you know, what rung of the ladder of resident engagement are we on from like Arnstein, is it Arnstein I think it is? Okay. Arnstein's ladder of engagement. And the model <clears throat> that is typically proliferated um, today is you know, we taught when uh, when a government or, or an elected official says that they're going to do robust community engagement or they're they're going to finally like actually engage deeper than anyone else ever has. Um, right now, what they typically mean is actually we're going to stay on that third rung of informing you, um, maybe even doing a little bit of consultation with you, which is, you know, uh, the third or fourth rung. Um, but for the first time, we're going to inform our black communities in the South Side. And it's like, you know, that that's not enough. And we need to be ready to demand more and say, actually, we need to be climbing the, that ladder of engagement rather than just having more people being informed about what we're doing. Um, and that's some of the frustration that I've felt working in the city of Richmond is their goal, their metric for success is just informing more people about what they're doing as a city and how great they are doing at delivering services. Um, rather than actually getting to a place where we're collaborating on policy, as Jennifer alluded to, um, and pushing them to seed control of decision making in certain spaces. Um, so it's, it's, it's a longer road to get towards that. Yeah, yeah. I would say too that like you can see the there's like these ben like the benefits of the of the process, right? One is like money is being spent based on community knowledge right like it's it's rooted in community needs like you're you're a, uh, um, a mother who's walking her baby or you're a grandmother who's wa walks and is problem walking and they need traffic calming um, so you can you can get that get that heard in a different way and have access to that that and have different different relationship um, also what I love about it is it scaffolds people's ability right like like you can show up at PB and be like, I got an idea. And like, you can throw your idea in the bucket um, or you could participate in being a part of the steering committee, or you could 
show up at a proposal development process or you I mean, there's all these different ways and they're and they're like they, they, they range from like the very small fast immediate like done you're out kind of thing to being like yeah i'm i'm following this for a whole year um and so i think it like it scaffolds and responds to people's ability and creates opportunities in a bunch of different ways for people to, to participate in in making their communities better um and one thing i'll say is that is brilliant about what daniel and them are doing in richmond is that um typically if you go to your city council member and you're like i want to do a participatory budgeting process and we want a million dollars and then the, we want a million dollars but we also need like this money to do the process um like first of all they've got money to do engagement if it, if they care about it so we can that there's a budget there to, to pay for that um and that they're already spending money on capital improvement they've already approved a budget what you're telling them is you're not taking adding more money to that what you're doing is taking a part of that money and allocating it in a way that hasn't been done before um so it's, that doesn't really take always take like extra money to to do this um, it takes extra just desire like i just it always comes down to like do city council and seven members care actually care about having a relationship with the people they're supposed to be working for so well great is that that we're gonna pull it pull it end it there or Bo, do you one more pg do you want more, one more thought everybody's ready for dinner <laughs> Well, it's great. I think this sets us up for potential future speakers that we can discuss offline. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.